You're not even going to be in there now. I got news for you. It's okay. strictly for me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Egotist. Self serving. We're on. Okay, we're rolling. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> This is an interview with Alex Lebenstein, and I would like you to identify yourself to begin with. Mm, thank you, and good morning. My name is Alex Lebenstein, Lebenstein in German, or here we call Le Lebenstein. Translated into Livingston. English would be Livingston, yes. No, that's unimportant. So, I was born in Germany in a town called Halton in Westphalia on November 3rd, 1927. Uh, I am a Holocaust survivor, and I'd like to uh, give some documentary here of my past. Yes. Um, what languages do you speak? I speak English, German, and Yiddish. Okay. Tell me, where you were living in Haltern, could you describe and this is in Germany, describe your life as you remember it before Kristallnacht, which was or in the early 30s. Okay, to the best of my recollection, those would be the first 11 years of my life. Yes. And uh, I grew up in this uh, Roman Catholic town. Uh, Life in the city was, in my opinion, rather nice, was rather good. Uh, uh, as a child, up to uh, about 1937, when, when I realized that things were not so glossy or anymore. Uh, could before we get to that, I, I guess I didn't ask the question too well. How far back can you remember? You were, where were you born? In this town in Halton, in, Halton. in Germany, yes. Was there a hospital in Halton? Yes, there was a small hospital. But I was not born at the, in the hospital, I was born at home. Oh. Yes, most of uh, birth took place in the private homes. Can you tell us about your home, your family, and life when you were little, really young? My family was a well-established family. And my grandfather was born in a, a town right nearby in Halton. It was the same district, more or less. And uh, in fact, my grandparents are buried in Halton. So my father also was born just nearby in a small town called Reken. And, uh, but they How do you spell these towns? How do you spell Halton? H-A-L-T-E-R-N, Reken, R-E-C-K-E-N. Mm -hmm. Both of them, of course, in Westphalia, in the western part of Germany. Um, my, my grandfather was a livestock uh, dealer. Uh, my father also dealt in livestock, but also was a butcher. He had our, we had a small slaughterhouse, and um, he would go and purchase cattle or sheep himself from the farmers and slaughter in this small slaughterhouse. He had a sausage factory there where he would make his uh, famous sausage, which was very well accepted, very highly accepted and liked. Uh, it was a small Jewish community, uh, to the best of my recollection, uh, some 40 some odd families. At that time when I was little, there was a need for uh, kosher meat. Uh, my father 
uh, studied to become a shochet, which is the uh, permission to slaughter for the kosher, for a Jewish home, which keeps kosher. And um, as such, uh, he, he slaughtered he slaughtered enough to supply the local community with kosher meat. The products that were not usable for kosher, like the hindquarters, he would sell off to the non-kosher, quote unquote, competitors. They were only competitors in form of that they were butchers. They were also his friends because he also was a war veteran of the First World War. And went to war fighting for Germany with many of these friends and re remained friend, friends with them after coming back in 1918 from the war. So he was able to fulfill the and satisfy the Jewish community with kosher meat and supply the other butchers with some of the hindquarters, which were so much more favorable for that industry. And they were pleasing each other. So business was conducted rather harmoniously. We had a small synagogue there, uh, enough so that we could have a minion. And uh, on occasion, if I remember, about 1935 or 36, uh, when we were short to have a minion, we brought in a couple of young men from a larger town. They became guests of my parents, and they helped us to conduct services. Uh, I myself went to Catholic school. I was the only child in this particular class that was Jewish. Uh, in the younger years, I don't recall having any problems with the children until about 1937. Uh, we played together, we studied together. When it came to Catholic religion, religious uh, uh, schooling, I was excused. Well, it was up to my parents to give me Hebrew lessons or I went home when lessons were not available in the small town. And. Uh, we played together, I played together with these children and uh, didn't feel any anxiety or uh, any kind of prejudice, again, until later on. Did you always have plenty to eat in those, say, before 1937, your father uh, was able to make a good living? Oh yes, my father made a good living and there was always plenty to eat. Uh, I very vaguely co re uh, remember that uh, uh, our home was such where we had special quarters for people that worked and learned under my father's jurisdiction. He was a master slaughterer and master sausage maker, and as such, in Germany, in order to go into business, you have to take a minimum of seven years of learning before you can get a license to open a business. At least that's how it was in those days. Okay. And uh, uh, some of these years, uh, these young men would uh, live in our quarters and work with my father in the slaughterhouse. And that became less and less while time went by. and. Um, uh, by about 1937, it was already very difficult for anybody to work for my father. First of all, it, it was discouraged for non-Jewish people to work with a Jew. And second of all, or probably most of all, the business had died down because of uh, the spread of anti-Semitism, not to purchase from Jewish people. A lot of the people in the city were not inclined to be seen in our store anymore. And uh, it dwindled down after a while that my father only supplied the kosher community and there was really not enough to uh, employ any, uh, anybody else. Mm -hmm. hmm. Did you have 
Were there other children in your family? I am the youngest. I had three sisters. My oldest sister, Hilda, passed away of natural causes, I believe in March of 1932. Mm -hmm. I was roughly five years old. I do remember her. I remember her coming from a hospital without hair and wearing a cap. Hmm. What her illness was was never disclosed to me. My next sister's name was Rose, and then I have a sister by the name of Alice. My sister Rose lived here in Richmond, Virginia. Later. R yes, later on. and. Uh, well, she passed away 11 years ago. Back to that time, uh, were the sisters in, in the house with you when you were growing up? My sisters were with us till about 1937. Mm -hmm. At that time, it became, like I said before, increasingly difficult for my father to earn and even to pay bills because there was really not enough income. And it was suggested that my sister should go to work in a larger city for some rich people and work in a household, which they did. Mm -hmm. My older sister worked in a small town called Elde, near Bielefeld. And she worked, in fact, for a while for a, uh, an uncle of mine, uh, who was married to my mother's sister. And uh, uh, my uh, other sister worked in the city of Bielefeld, also in household. Mm -hmm. They did come occasionally, they came home, and sometimes I went to visit them during uh, the years of like 38, in the beginning of 38 or late of 37. Did your, obviously Rose survived. Uh, she came to Richmond, you said, and she passed away here. Uh, did your other sister also survive? Yes, both of my sisters, being that they were older than myself, were able to get affidavits to immigrate to England. I see. And uh, therefore, they were spared from going to the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. My both, well, my sister Rose married uh, Edward Spanier uh, in England and then moved on to the United States and then settled here in Richmond, Virginia. My sister Alice remained in England until uh, 1947, mm. uh, late of 1947, and uh, then joined my sister here in uh, Richmond, Virginia. No, I think she came in 1948. But uh, she, she came with a little afterwards. daughter, her name is Jeanette. Mm -hmm. So after uh, they left for England, it was your parents and you living in Haltern. Uh, when did they leave for England? My sister, they left in, um, in 39, oh. you were still able to immigrate in 1939. They were like of the last people to go to England. Uh, at that particular time, this was already after Kristallnacht. Right, right. Um, so you were attending the public school, the Catholic school, and uh, what was happening to the Jewish community, we're talking still before November 1938, Kristallnacht. Um, did many of the Jews of Haltern leave? Were they able to get away? People that had money or had connections in foreign lands, like in England or the States, saw the writing on the wall. People that were not too gullible, moved away, and were able to immigrate. My parents obviously choose not to. Do you know why? Did they make attempts to leave? 
I am not sure if they made attempts to leave. I can only surmise that it was too difficult for them to send me off to get permission to send me off or to get an affidavit to get me on a transport for children. And they certainly wouldn't abandon me. Uh, you know, it's at that particular time I was uh, like nine and ten years old. And, but I believe most of all, my parents were very German. Mm -hmm. They believed in their country, they believed in the neighbors. They never would have believed that anything as horrific as we know it to have happened uh, would have turned out to be so terrible. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the foresight would have been there if they might, might have tried to flee Germany. Uh, but uh, to the best of my recollection, my father really had hoped that this would just blow over and it would be a short uh, interruption in the German in the life in Germany for Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Do you remember discussions in your family about what was what might happen or what could or what was happening? I was very shielded. Mm -hmm. My parents tried their best to uh, shield me from what was going on politically, from whatever they realized in atrocities that were going on. Uh, they tried to hide all this from me. Uh, and, uh, so uh, I don't, uh, I did not have really an eye opener until Crystal Nacht. Let's move on to that time. How old were you, November 9th, 10th, 1938? Uh, 11 years old, being my birthday was November 3rd, yes. so it was exactly 11 years old. Would you describe what happened at that time? On that particular day? On, on that November day or what led to it? Were there any, uh, do you remember anything that uh, preceded it that could have Anti-Semitism, was there anti, did you feel anti-Semitism before Kristallnacht? From 1937, I already realized that I was not able to walk safely in the streets. Mm -hmm. What did you fear? Uh, uh, well, uh, children would uh, spit at us and um, even uh, tried to attack me in the streets. I was, uh, they wouldn't play with me anymore. Their parents told them that they were not uh, allowed to play with a Jewish boy. And uh, my parents needed to uh, watch over me that I should not go by myself on many occasions. And when I did, I sometimes had problems uh, to, to uh, come home safely. So, you are already sensing this. Tell us what happened then on Kristallnacht. Well, uh, I believe it was November 7th. Well, there was, uh, where I overheard some talk among neighbors with my father, some of the neighbors that stood friendly with my father, his buddies, that uh, someone killed a German person uh, in Paris, and uh, that uh, the government took this as an excuse to beat down on the Jews even more severely, to come down on them even more severely. Mm -hmm. And there were some stories of Jewish people being arrested on 
the following day, about like the 8th of November. Mm -hmm. And on November 9th, um, it was very widely publicized that in the larger towns, Jewish homes were being destroyed and synagogues were burning, that uh, hordes of Nazis went to Jewish homes, plundered their home, threw the furniture into the streets, broke up everything, chased them to the street. If anybody protested, they were arrested. So you got news of this happening elsewhere. In other towns. <coughs> My father, of course, being so very German and so gullible, talking to his friends and neighbors, really didn't believe it would affect him because the neighbors told him, look, this is such a small town, they're not going to bother you here. They're not going to come here. What should they do with just a handful of Jewish people were left at that time? Probably less than 10 families. And uh, my father wanted to believe that he would be safe with the assurance of his friends, his neighbors. And they were absolutely right. Nothing happened on November 9th in our town. And they celebrated themselves in that evening while in other towns some synagogues were burning and other Jewish people were suffering. Little did they know that on November 10th, hordes of people even from the bigger cities came to, the, to our town and news came from some neighbors. Some of my father's friends told him that a house belonging to one Abram Weil was being destroyed, that windows were broken and furniture being thrown into the street. Abram Weil was uh, the one Jewish person that was known to be wealthy in this town, helped Halton out of bankruptcy on many, many occasions, was very active politically, and was very much of a, a German citizen. And everybody su was surprised that if anybody would attack anyone, it should not have been Abram Weil, because he was such a good Jew. Shortly thereafter, we heard that this Gemeindehaus, which is the little schoolhouse that was once used in front of the synagogue, and later was converted to living quarters where a family by the name of Daniels lived. Um, and the synagogue was right behind this house that they, this hordes of people came to the Daniels house. Mrs. Daniels was a hat maker, ladies' hats, and that uh, um, the merchandise was laying in the street and then we were told that the synagogue was being broken up and damaged very, very severely. But again, my, my father's friends came and said, Nathan, don't worry, they're not going to come here. They're not, they know that you are a true German and you fought in the war, in the First World War, side by side with us. They're not going to touch you. They're not going to do anything to you. You've never done anything wrong. And um, they're just not going to bother you. My, my father, even at that particular time, still wanted to believe, but I saw him also getting very anxious. And uh, we, we heard that another Jewish home was being plundered, and it was suggested by my, uh, by my father's friends that he should go and put his medals on his chest that he earned during the First World War to show that he is a veteran and that he has a right like anybody else to live there, which he did. He put on his medals and with some friends stood in front of our home. I was standing right beside him. And here these hordes of people suddenly came around the corner screaming anti-Semitic slogans, some of them carrying an ax or sticks. And they did not even bother to wait to come close to the house and I heard the window shatter, my father screaming out to these guys, you cannot do this to me. How dare you? I'm German and all this. 
Did he know any of them? Were these people he knew? There were some, I knew a couple of the children that were dressed in Nazi uniforms that I, some a couple of years prior, went to school with. Mm -hmm. The parents already, you know, um, converted them to uh, the Hitler Jugend. I'm sure that my father also recognized some, but a lot of these uh, uh, SS uniform people came from out of town. The leading people, I believe, came from out of town. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I wouldn't be able to uh, verify if my father knew exactly who was who. Mm -hmm. And here they were breaking the windows, and before you know, people started to run into the house, and uh, some of them went upstairs, and before you knew it, our, my father's, my parents' bedroom furniture were flying through the window from upstairs into the street. And I heard my mother scream inside, let's get out of here. They are killing us. They're killing us. By the way, this is recorded in the archives in Halton. So uh, I just want to mention it so it could be verified that this, these were my mother's words. They documented this themselves yes. in Halton. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I'm staying with my father at all simultaneously. Simultaneously, this all happened quite fast. And uh, here, these, this big SS guy approaches him, comes straight to him, and, and my father holds out his arms to say, Stop, you cannot go into my house. Well, how dare you get these guys out of here? And this SS guy, S guy said, What do you have there? He says, I'm a, a German soldier, I'm a decorated soldier, I fought for this country, and I have a right to be here. This SS guy looked at him. And he tore the metals off his chest, stamped down on these metals and broke them in the street, and then spat in his face, started to beat down on him. And here I'm holding on to my father. This is the first time that I saw my parents being beaten and chased. And it became obviously probably the most hurtful time in my life, more painful perhaps than the physical pain I l endured later on. Uh, it uh, it left an everlasting uh, damage to me. I recall this moment very clearly. Hearing my mother scream, we ran into the house, passed by some of these hoods that were destroying the house, through the little slaughter house to the back street. Didn't know for a moment where to go. And then it was suggested that we should go to a little garden that, that we had like a uh, few hundred meters from the house, a little vegetable garden that my father planted the vegetables there, which my mother used, used to can for the winter time. Uh, we had a little gazebo in there, with a little table. This is a place where my father used to entertain himself with his friends playing cards in that time off. I remember the trellis on the outside of this gazebo. He planted beans, and even though this was November, I remember there were still some good-sized leaves on, on this trellis. And, uh, it made us feel safe that we could not be seen just like that. And we went into this little gazebo, and we hid there. And some of his friends, of course, knew where we were. It was getting cold, because by this time already it was afternoon and on November 10th. And uh, the climate uh, is such that it was getting cold. And some of the friends came and brought us some hot coffee, some sandwiches, and blankets. We stood here for a while. Then one of my father's friends came as a messenger and said to my father, Nathan, the SS is looking for you. You cannot remain here. They will find you here. This big guy that tore off your medals claims that you spat in his face, not that he spat in your face. And from the stories we hear, that's like instant death, and you cannot remain here. 
you need to flee. Uh, my father says, where am I going to go? Yes, I'm here with my wife and my son. It's a small town. Everybody knows us. There is no way to go for one block without being recognized. It's very difficult to move about without being found. And he said something to this guy that maybe it would be better for him to give himself up so he would, that uh, my mother and I would be safe. And uh, his friends protested that idea, something to the effect you never were a coward before, you don't give up without a fight, you need to try to stay alive. And it was suggested that we should move on from this little garden and possibly to hide at the cemetery. Cemetery on the outskirts of this little town, very much in walking distance from there. However, we need to pass several homes and some streets. It was, I felt like we are going in a position of hide and seek, being looked out for by some of my father's friends to guide us to the cemetery. We finally did reach the cemetery in safety. There was an enclave with some overgrown shrubs and trees. It was suggested that we should hide in there. And surely uh, no one would come to the cemetery to look for us or look for my father. It would never occur to them that we were hiding at the cemetery. And again, that's what my parents wanted to believe, and that's what we did. And we hid in this underbrush on the cemetery. And after a while, it was getting really cold. Darkness was settling in. I don't remember exactly if it was around 5 o'clock or so in the afternoon. And suddenly, there were these noises again with hordes of people coming along the cemetery street. And I remember there was an iron gate that would let you into the cemetery. I don't think that iron gate in all the years it was there was ever oiled and it squeaked. It was a horrible squeak. And these hordes of people came screaming into the cemetery. And my mother saying to my father, we were sold out. We are, of course, in the right place. We will never leave the cemetery. With these hordes of people, they're going to finish us all off right now. We'll go to, to rest with your pair, my, my father's parents, and with Hilda, my older sister, who was buried there. And, of course, we huddled together being very much frightened, holding on to each other, not sounding any more words, not speaking anymore. These hordes of people came in, rushing into the cemetery. We thought they would come straight for us, but they went straight to the gravestones and destroyed all the gravestones. They, they demolished every gravestone. I believe maybe one that was hidden under some tree, a very old one, remained. And they spent quite some time, because they didn't just topple them over, some of them they really broke up into pieces. And then there was a quiet all the way in the back of the cemetery, and again I hear my mother whisper, they're probably digging our grave over there. Shortly thereafter, we saw the crowd moving back in our direction. It was very, a very frightening moment. Then this SS man started walking straight towards us. We totally froze. We thought that was the end. But he stopped about 20, 25 yards from us only to relieve himself right in our direction. After that, he turned and ordered his so-called troops to leave and go home. 
Were you obscured from their view? Were you behind enough we bushes? Were, oh they yes. Didn't, you they believe they did not see you? No, they did not see us. They were not able to see us. Nobody came into that direction. That was uh, quite an enclave. It's very overgrown, and they didn't go over there at all because mm -hmm. there were no graves on that side at all. You know, that was like for later on for a future cemetery. Mm -hmm. It was like an abandoned piece of land. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So after they left, things quieted down. Again. My father was really blessed with some friends. Don't let anybody say that all Germans are bad. They are, of course, good people among all people. They are always righteous people and righteous Gentiles, as well um, uh, among the German people, as well as under any other race or in any other country. These people really cared for us and came back and again brought us some hot drinks and blankets. And after everything quieted down, I don't remember how long we were there. Time had no meaning. But uh, it was suggested that we should leave the cemetery. We went to a place that was a, like what we know today as a bed and breakfast place. And my father was very friendly with the owner of this place and they hid us in their basement. And again, it is so long ago that I don't remember for how long we were in this basement, if it was one night or two nights. But when the out-of-town Nazis left, the city government knew then where we were. And they established a, a flat, an apartment, in a house that formerly belonged to Hermann Cohn, or still belonged to Hermann Cohn at that time. And it was a large loft, and they assembled all the Jewish people in this one loft that they called this, this Judenhaus. So I remember the address was 28 Münsterstraße in Halton. And this house had belonged to one of the Jews, Hermann was Cohen. Hermann Cohn was still a survivor. He was with us at that particular time in this flat. But... Uh, all the Jewish people, because nobody could go back to their homes. Their homes were all damaged or destroyed or uh, they were not livable because at least the windows were broken, the furniture were broken up and so on. And this, in this ho uh, home, which they called the Judenhaus, this was then our near future home. How many people were left, how many Jews were then assembled in this house? Do you have any idea? I could only guess. It might have been about 15 at that particular time. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier in remarks to my sisters that you still could get out in 1939, in early 39, so were a, some of these people able to immigrate or get permission to go to bigger cities to uh, move in with their loved ones in other cities or whatever. And it dwindled down that at the end we were only five people in this Juden house. I see. Did you, the three of you, have a room in this house, or two rooms, or? It was a large flat. It was very crowded on the first few days when we were there, until some of the people left. And near the end, of course, there was quite a bit of room, because it was a large loft. So you entered this Juden house. It was still November, middle of November, 1938. Right. How long were you there all together? We were in this Juden house until January of 1942. I think about this sometimes, and I'm wondering if some of these friends, my father's friends, had something to do with it, that we were able to remain in this city while so many people from all other cities were sent to concentration camps so much earlier. We did not have to go in hiding. Yes, there was an SS man or a Wehrmacht or somebody was watching this house so we couldn't just leave when we wanted. We needed special permis permission to, to leave. 
uh, and yes, we were permitted to do some shopping in town at given times, usually in the evening. Uh, there were some food stamps, some rations, uh, which my parents got. And, uh, uh, but when we came to the stores, I also remember we had to go to the store from the back door, not from the front. And uh, of course, these people all knew my parents and they did the best they could to accommodate us with food. So food was not uh, uh, so much of a question, even so in general, even to the uh, people in Halton, it was running sh a lot shorter than it was before. But uh, you remember having food and... Yes. Now, you... You were there three years and two months right. in the student house. Right. And you were 11 until you were 14. You were living there right. with your parents. I was 14, uh, 14 years and two months <coughs> old when finally... Well, let's talk about those three years. Okay. Um, you had food. Did you have an education? No. Uh, I had special permission to travel to a neighboring town, Recklinghausen, for, uh, in early 1939, where they still allowed a small Jewish school. But the education over there was very, very limited, very restricted. It was mostly on Jewish history. Mm -hmm. You traveled uh, by train? By train. Sometimes I took uh, a bicycle that was available to me to go to the train, or I walked. The walking distance was not that severe. The uh, distance from uh, by train to the neighboring town was maybe 16 or 15 kilometers. I don't recall exactly. So it was maybe a half an hour ride on the train. But that was very short-lived. As far as truly an education, uh, my education was very limited. And obviously, it really stopped in 1938. And all I had is these couple of years of elementary school education. Were you bar mitzvah? Yes. I was bar mitzvah. I was bar mitzvah in, uh, in, in a very quiet way in this city of Recklinghausen where there was one very prominent Jewish family whose ho house was not damaged and they were allowed to live there. They paid off a lot of people. They were in the tobacco business. Their name was Aaron and uh, for some reason or other, this man in this rather large house, down in the basement, he had like a vault in the wall, and he had a Torah, a Sefer Torah, in this basement hole. Uh, my bar mitzvah was done very, very quickly. It was my, f my parents' wish that I should be accepted as a man in our religion. It was done on a very much on a QT. I am not sure, I don't remember exactly if we had enough for a minion in this basement. We probably did, but I don't remember. And uh, I did my uh, blessings and I did a reading from the Torah, uh, a short reading, and quickly the Torah was back into hiding and we dispersed, went back to my hometown in Halton and lived in this student house. Did your father have an occupation during this time in these three years? Uh, my father, as I mentioned earlier, he was a master butcher and sausage maker. Mm -hmm. Of course, he was not allowed to pursue that. However, he, he was given a job to work in a brick factory enough enough to earn enough money to pay f alongside with the food stamps for the things that we needed. Mm -hmm. All other monies were taken, frozen, confiscated, including the house. Uh, the house was taken, of course, for non-payment. How could he possibly have made a payment on mortgage or taxes or both? I don't remember exactly what it was. If there was no income, he was not allowed to to earn money or uh, to conduct the business. So there was no 
true cash available to him directly from a bank. And uh, he went to work in this brick factory. And your mother stayed in the Newton house yes. and had access to a kitchen working yes. with the other women. Right. Do you remember where you ate? Was there a, a, very a large common dining room? Yeah, it, the kitchen was a very large kitchen, mm -hmm. very large room. Uh, there was not, uh, I don't recall a formal dining room, and I don't even remember how these furniture got there mm -hmm. because uh, most of the furniture were damaged or thrown out. So. I don't know if somebody set them up before they put us into the Juden house or during the time. Was Herman Cohen, the owner of the house, living in the house still? Right. With you? With us in the same apartment. Mm -hmm. I believe that I s you showed me once a picture of Herman Cohen being paraded. What was That's this? That's correct. In 1939, when we lived in the Juden house, no different than my father had these good friends. Herman Cohn also was a veteran, and he had his friends. Some of his friends were farmers. This one farmer, I don't think there could have been a closer friendship any place than that of this farmer and Herman Cohn. This farmer would come and smuggle fresh eggs, bread, butter and things and fruit into the Juden house so Herman would be nourished. He was an elderly person, older than my parents by possibly 10, 15 years. I don't remember exactly what his age was, but he was older. He was a small person and frail. And this farmer really wanted to be helpful. Well, one day this farmer got caught bringing bread and food items to Herman Cohen. The SS took the farmer and put a bit, big placard over his chest. And on the placard, it read, Diese Eier und Brot waren für den Juden Herman Cohen. I'll translate. These eggs and bread were for the Jew Herman Cohen. And Herman Cohn was carrying a little wicker basket. In it was some bread and eggs and whatever. And they marched them through the street of Halton. They beat them on occasion. And they announced that anybody who would help the U Jews in Juden House, they would do even worse too, and they could lose their lives. The Documentation for this also is in the archives of Halton and is available at this time. That's the picture that I remember. Yes. Um, is there anything else that you remember from the time in the Juden House? The other people, they gradually went elsewhere, were taken in in other cities, you said. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, is there anything else from that time, or do you want to move on to January 1942? Well, I, I might just say that uh, life, of course, was very restricted over here, well, needless to say, really, but uh, it wasn't really safe for anybody to uh, go in the streets by, by themselves, even when we had permission. But sometimes it was necessary to, to do so, especially when it became already 1940 and 1941. I remember being in Juden House and uh, when the after the war started and the aircraft from England came over and bombs were falling all over, very, very close by to this house and exploding. And uh, the I remember the sirens going off at any time in the middle of the night. And it was very difficult for us to hide in the basement over there. Yes, on occasion we were able to, like uh, the SS men or the Wehrmacht men that was watching the house would tell us to go down there and he would probably uh, sometimes go with us into the basement. Mm -hmm. And we were hiding over there. So we, uh, 
experienced the attack of the Allied forces as early as then. Did you have radio, newspaper? Did you know what was going on? was not permitted to have radios. It was not permitted to have newspapers. However, when my father worked over there, mm -hmm. and again, you were able under, uh, with some help from some friends, to get news and to get an occasional newspaper. It was, of course, dangerous to carry it with you, but no different than a farmer carried eggs and bread for him and corn. Uh, a lot of things were done in such a way. After all, we needed to survive. What happened then in January of 42? And how did it come about? Okay, uh, during this time while we were in Munich House, we were told by the city government and by some uh, Nazi organizations that at all times we should have a release back because we would be transported to a different city that would be a Jewish city where we all, only Jews, would live and we could earn a living there and we would resume our normal lives there, but we would not be able to take anything other than what we could carry. In a suitcase. In a suitcase, or mm -hmm. what we could carry. So this suitcase was packed for each one of us. And it, that order came as early as the end of 1938. And we were reminded, if not weekly, it was monthly, if the suitcase was packed because they are going to come next week to pick you up. Hmm. And this how it went from late 1938 until January, the beginning of January 1942, when it became true that an old school bus pulled up with some Nazi uh, SS men, and they hoarded the last five people that were in this apartment into this old school bus and drove us to a large neighboring town called Gelsenkirchen. Over there, we were accumulated from different cities, like from Dortmund, and eventually, after being in this uh, uh, big place that formerly housed a circus, uh, I, I don't remember if we were there day two or three either, but we were sent from there to Riga, Latvia. Was that interior? Were you inside a, a building? A large building, in like Gales a huge, Kirchen? huge building. I remember uh, some places on the floor had big iron planks. I don't know what was underneath, possibly steam pipes mm -hmm. or something. And people were assembled there from other towns, From too. other towns, from smaller towns mm -hmm. like our town. Mm -hmm. So you were there several days. Yeah, I, don't, I just don't remember if it was right. two days or three days, but yes, we were there. You had the suitcases. Each person, one suitcase? Whatever, yeah, whatever we could carry. What you could carry. Yeah. And then what happened? Then we were hoarded into a cattle car that came right to this here building. You know, like I said, there was a circus. It used to be a circus, so the uh, cattle cars used to deliver the elephants and stuff over there to... <laughs> perform, so the track was right there, and they hoarded us into these cattle cars and transported us to Riga, Latvia. Were the cars crowded? Could you very, sit? Very crowded. Uh, you were with your parents? I was with my parents, yes. Uh, it was very crowded. Uh, sometimes, when people pushed over so tight just to keep warm, so then, then you had a little room in one corner to sit on the floor, and there was a, a, a big bucket that was the toilet. So that's how we were in this cattle car. And how far is that? Do you know now from Gelsenkirchen in Germany? I never checked to out the Riga. I no, I never checked out the the atlas. No, I never checked out uh, how many kilometers or mm -hmm. how many miles it is. I somehow I sh you might have, have done that. Any recollection how long you were on? The I believe it was two nights. Two nights. 
No food? Food? No, there was some water mm -hmm. and stuff. I don't remember any food other than what we carried with us. Mm -hmm. You know, what we were allowed to take even from Halton. I think that was probably the one of the main things that Do you remember uh, how the conversation, how you felt, how your parents, what was, what were you thinking? Uh, I think that uh, looking back that everybody was so stunned that the word thinking you could rule out. I don't think that, I don't believe that the mind could really think of anything of what to do. We were truly prisoners. We, there was no escape. We didn't know what the next minute would bring. Did you know your destination? No, we did not know our destination. Didn't find out until we came into the ghetto direct that we were in Riga, Latvia. It was a bitter cold day when we arrived there. There was a lot of ice and snow. Uh, remember, uh, jumping out of this cattle car and grabbing some ice to suck on. And uh, then we marched to the ghetto. Where in the ghetto? Describe what you remember of the ghetto in okay. Riga. Uh, let me describe the ghetto the way I recollect and what I know about it. It was originally a ghetto for only for Latvian Jews. The Nazis sorted out all these people and took away all the women to a different camp. And then hoarded all the Latvian men to one side of the ghetto and put a barbed wire, emptied a larger portion of the ghetto completely out. This were all the transports of Jewish people from Germany and from Czechoslovakia and from, uh, from Vienna came into. So when you arrived, there were Latvian men. The women had been taken away. Yes. And I don't remember any Latvian women. I only remember Latvian men. And places were vacated for you, the incoming. Yeah, a great portion of the city. These were uh, apartment buildings, mostly. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and several stories high. I, five stories, six story high. So this is what you found when you arrived? That's, and yeah, we were assigned to one of these buildings to a loft, again, very crowded, just hoarded into it. Uh, the first few days, uh, barely uh, enough where to stretch out on the floor to take a nap. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, then the sorting came out, you know, we, we always had to, uh, uh, come to uh, the street, to the marketplace, whatever they called it, and uh, people were sorted out to go to work in different camps. And what we didn't rea realize that a lot of the elderly people at that time were already shipped off to different kind of camps, or uh, what I found out after liberation were marched to the forest in nearby in Riga and shot. And so after a while, there were a few less people in this apartment because of the sorting out. But I remained there for a few months with my parents. I remember the address. It was 36 Lutzas Jella. They called it then the Düsseldorfer Straße because the Düsseldorf, Düsseldorf Transport was there. I believe that's what it was called. But in, in Latvian it was Lutzas Jella, 36 Lutzas Jella. You remember all these addresses. Well, <laughs> there's some things that are very, yeah. you know, that so deeply embedded that you cannot forget. Well, I might not remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, but uh, uh, these things obviously uh, have made such a deep negative impression on me, such a painful impression on me. And when it's very difficult not to remember because Unfortunately, this is what dreams are made up from. You lived here. You had food? There was some food assigned in Rationed. the ghetto. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was some food assigned and uh, not much, but what 
what they did not assign, we were able to get from working commanders. We, a lot of groups went out to work in Riga, in Latvia, to all kinds of assignments. Your father? And, and uh, my father was assigned, being that they knew he was a butcher, they assigned him to work in a slaughterhouse. And somehow, of course, he was able to, uh, well, he was not assigned to slaughter or make sausage, he was assigned to salt hides, which is the lowest part of work in, in the slaughterhouse. That's the true slave labor, that assigned not even usually to uh, uh, people that learn the butcher business to begin with. Mm -hmm. But salting heights was very, very important because leather was much more important then than it's probably today. We have a lot of synthetic items today. And it needed to be salted down properly. And that was the assignment my father had. It was had. part of the process of making hides into leather. garments? For curing. No, for curing hides to make leather, like for shoes, for shoe shoes. soles, and yeah, mm -hmm. you know, hides, big mm -hmm. cow hides. Mm -hmm. Many times, when these cow hides came right fresh from the slaughterhouse, the butchers were kind of careless, and there was a little piece of meat hanging here and there, and my father had a little knife, he would cut it out and hide it on his body and bring it home, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, uh, like that, we were able to supplement ourselves, but that was very, very short-lived. Mm -hmm. um, mm, my father developed a terrible infection in his hands. There were cuts on his hands and from the salt burned into his hands. There was no medical attention uh, available for this. And uh, after a couple of months being in Riga, this uh, uh, infection developed into a blood poison, eventually into lockjaw. I remember so well my father in so much pain. There was a wooden chair, one of these old wooden chairs, and he was sitting backwards and biting into the railing of this wooden chair. I can still see his teeth marks in the wood out of pain. And then one day, he simply couldn't go to work no more. I also remember the odor coming from his hands, from the infections. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't go to work anymore, and the uh, people that were in charge of putting together their work commando came to get him, and they saw that he was not able to move, that he was really uh, already fantasizing. They called some medics from the SS groups. Before you know it, my father was taken out of the apartment. That's the last time I saw my father, as except for I could only assume that when we looked out of the window, and it was a, a lot of ice, a lot of snow on the ground, and for some reason, they have very big sleds over there. And when we saw the same people that came to uh, the apartment to get my father, we saw on a sled somebody laying on a sled fully covered, and they dragged him away. For all intents and purposes, he might have been already deceased at that particular time. We were told the next day that he had passed away, and they he was buried in some mass grave inside the ghetto of Riga at a cemetery. Mm. This was the work your father did. You were 14. Were you, did you work? By that time, yes, I was already obviously past 14, almost 14 and a half. My first assignment was to break up bombed out buildings in Riga, where we took uh, uh, bricks and cleared off the old mortar so the bricks could be reused, or iron beams, or even wooden beams, to clean them off for reusing. So and you, uh, you left every morning, and every morning to do this work? Yes, we were 21 people in this particular commando, what it was called, and it was called Commando 21. 
uh, was put together from three different transports. Dortmund, from Vienna, and I don't recall the other one offhand. But was the Düsseldorf, maybe? It was it's possible. It, it does make no difference. Mm -hmm. They were all fellow prisoners. And uh, there were seven from each commando, as from each uh, district to this commando, and they called it Commando 21. Well, you were Gelsenkirchen, right? Oh, yes. That was probably then. I don't remember what okay. section it came from. And uh, uh, anyway, every day we marched on these icy streets. That was February, March, April. Possibly into May, I'm not sure. Time did not have so much meaning. Where we cleaned off these bricks and these iron bars, we reused. We were able to be in touch with some of the Latvian people. By the way, they were very rigid and extremely anti-Semitic. You had to be very careful not to be sold out by them. They would try to deal with you for something. Maybe that you might trade a watch for bread or whatever. And after they got what they had, they would turn you in and get back the bread or whatever they gave you anyway. This, of course, was very illegal. We were not allowed to exchange anything on these working commandos. One day when we came back to the camp, to the ghetto, I believe it was in early May. We were intercepted by uh, a bunch of SS officers right at the gate and searched. Somebody obviously sold us out. And they found something practically on all of us. We all had a little something to carry back to the camp to our loved ones. It was a way of life. And they started to beat down on us for having committed such thing of trading. And they took all 21 of us, and in the ghetto there was a jail. And they put us all in the jail. And they told us, we'll take care of you tomorrow. We were in this jail and for several days. I don't... I really don't understand. I mean, they were shooting people all over the place. Why they didn't shoot all of us right then and there? I could only assume that they were running short on help, especially on useful people that were able to work. And they wanted to think about if they, uh, if they could punish us with different kind of work or slave labor or something. This is only an assumption I'm making. We were in this jail several days. It had iron bars. It was a, a basement type of jail. It had iron bars on it to the outside. One day, I'm looking outside. I saw this young lady. And she spotted me looking through. And she came over. And obviously, she was a Jewish woman. And again, I remember her name because I'll never forget her name because she made a tremendous impact on me. Eventually, we realized that she saved my life. Her name was Anna Hirschenhauser, and she was from the Vienna Transport. Anna was a very vivacious, very pretty lady, maybe 18 or so. And the guards were out there. And she was a Jewish star, just looked at them, they stepped aside, and she walked straight over to, to, to the prison, and she started talking to me. And that went on several times, twice, possibly in one day. And through the bars, she gave me a kiss. And I didn't know what for, and she says, you'll be all right, you'll be all right. Rumors started to f that they decided to kill six of the 21 people, namely two from each commando, the oldest and the youngest. I was the very youngest one from my commando. And when this came and I saw Anna again, I said, well, this is what we hear. She says, don't worry, 
It's not going to happen. I see to it. I say, what power? She says, don't worry about it. I don't know what she did, if she was involved sexually with the SS or whatever. I, I really have no idea. But a day later, they hold off the three oldest men and they shot them and then released all of us shortly thereafter. So I think uh, she was one of uh, the angels in my life. Uh, I went back then to uh, my house. My mother was still there to this 36 Lutz at Yella, waiting to be reassigned. I was then assigned to go to work in a, what I could only describe as brown coal harvesting. They call it torf. Torf is, in my opinion, when properly processed, the equivalent of peat moss. But it's done, harvested over there in a much different manner than we know of our Canadian peat moss. It actually I is taken from inside the ground. It is black mud. You stay into water waist deep with these special shovels, you dig into this black mud, and you throw it on a converter belt. And this belt takes this mud into a machine that mills it, pushes it into forms. Some of, many of our people would pick up these forms, they were very heavy, and run them out into the pasture, turn them over in a proper way, in an alignment, and take the mold, which was out of metal, off and leave this mud there to dry out by the sun. They would run back the empty molds to the machines. I found out later that possibly that the way Anna saved my life was that she talked them into punishing me with special slave labor because it became known that very few people from Torf would come back, but you sometimes had a chance to escape if you spoke Latvian, which I didn't. But very few people came back from there. Anyway, I worked in this year most horrendous hole The labor is so severe, I cannot even describe it. In normal times, it is inconceivable. There was very little food. There was no fresh water to drink or to wash up. Sometimes we got an assignment of fresh clothes. They were used clothing, apparently, they were uh, sterilized and came from some of our people that lost their lives somewhere. Our bodies were full of lice. Typhus broke out many times. Any small wound on your body would be infected from the lice. It was such a terrible time. I still don't understand what kind of blessing I have to have survived that particular camp. Now this was not in Riga. This no, this was in a small town, uh, I believe it's somewhere north of Riga or north uh, east of Riga toward Estonia called Hasenpot. I believe in Latvian they spelled it something like ice put or ice putter. And uh, anyway, that this is a season, seasonal uh, item. 
This was during the summer? During the summer. Of until 42. the 42. Did you have a place to sleep there? Barracks. Barracks. Yeah. Everything was in very poor condition. Mm -hmm. Sanitary conditions were extremely poor. Food was very poor. The SS, the people that watched over us were extremely bad. They did not hesitate to kill anybody who, who didn't work fast enough, run fast enough as the moles, or do anything according to their needs. About how many people? Only men, right? No, no. Women too? There were women too. Yeah, a lot of women carried these uh, forms. Yeah, the men most of the time were in the hole digging the mud, and when the conveyor, which of course, uh, I don't believe there was a motor on it. I remember doing some work on the conveyor at times with a handle to turn the conveyor to get that mud up. All this is very, very hard work. Mm -hmm. Were there hundreds of people? 50? I would, I would guess that in this particular camp, maybe 500 people. Mm -hmm. And they worked on different uh, farms of this year in Brown Coal Torfstechen. Mm -hmm. And this was then dried and used as fuel? After that was dried, it was put into a different machine and ground down. Then it finally starts to look like peat moss. Okay. And it was used for fuel, also to put under animals instead of straw. The animal manure on top of this here peat moss was then used, of course, for planting soil. Mm -hmm. And that was the way of life there. This was the summer of 42. Right. And when did you get back to Riga? Did you ever go back? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, back to Riga. First from there, if I recall, for a short time, we went to a small camp called Salas Hills. Uh, do you have any idea how that would be spelled? Salas? You might do the best you can with the okay. spelling. Salas, Salas Hills. Okay. And... I believe hmm? another slave labor camp. Uh, another yeah a camp there was not a crematorium in this particular camp it was just slave labor and I believe the reason they sent us to Salas Pills was really to be deloused for those who survived the torch taking were strong enough I guess they wanted to use that uh, those people for more labor and uh, Instead of killing us or not sending us back, they sent us to Salas Pills, where they deloused us. We dumped all our clothes. We got fresh clothing, striped, you know, zebra clothes. And uh, also assigned in this camp for a while, I remember working on some used clothing. And the, these clothes obviously came from Jewish people because a lot of them had the Jewish stars on it. The Morgan David is the word Yuda. Some of them even spelled differently. I didn't realize why they were spelled differently in those days. Apparently they came from different countries where the word Jew was spelled differently. Some of them did not have the word in there, just the star or other kind of signs. Mm -hmm. And uh, th these clothes came in and they were being deloused, uh, disinfected over there and then sent to different camps, or when people like myself came in, we were given fresh clothes, and from there, I, I, I don't remember how long I was there. It could have been a week, it could have been two weeks. And, uh, and from there, I went back to the ghetto on Riga. I went back to my apartment. There were different people living this flat at this time, and my mother was gone. I was told that she was assigned to a different camp. I never saw her again. Having said that, also being kind of gullible, hoping that she was alive, I believe I never gave up that I would meet up with her again. And I said to myself, if I ever get out of this, I will look for her and I will find her. And I sincerely believe that that had a lot to do with me being alive today, it gave me the fight and the will to survive. I was obviously a mama boy because if 
uh, a son comes after three daughters, and so late in life, uh, you can well imagine that uh, her love to me was enormous. So then you found yourself alone in Riga. What then? Uh, from there, there were different transports. Another transport went first to a camp called Stutthof. No, I'm sorry, Kaiserwald. Sometimes get mixed up between the two camps. Kaiserwald, it was Kaiserwald. Kaiserwald. Yeah. yeah, it was Kaiserwald. And I don't remember if I did any work in Kaiserwald. All I remember I over there that we were uh, in some uh, factory type of building with uh, bunk beds, three tier high, the way you see s in some of the pictures, and uh, crowded together. And again, we, uh, uh, there was a lot of illness, there was very little food, very little water. We were ordered to come uh, uh, to stay at attention every morning when uh, a, a siren or a whistle blew. But I don't remember working out of this camp at all, except that uh, I was there on hold for some time. Kaiserwald, on the map, was a killing camp. Yes, was a there was camp. A, that was a crematorium camp. Yeah. That's correct. So you were sent there from Riga. Right. Do you know when that was? You were in the summer doing the peak. So in 42. I was there, and this was already in '43 when I was sent there. In '43, you were sent to Kaiserwald. To Kaiserwald, so and I don't remember. Winter in Riga. Yeah, that that winter I was still in Riga until sometime in '43. I don't remember what kind of work we did. Some kind of work inside the ghetto. I don't remember exactly. Okay, you had some notes. Was it in this book? I have some notes, right? Yeah, the chrono oh, you took those, okay. Yeah, 42, 43 in Kaiserwald. In Kaiserwald also, you know what you had in Kaiserwald? A lot of political prisoners. There were people from all nationalities. There were French soldiers uh, that were prisoners. And they didn't want to be with us, with the Jewish people, and they were terrible, but even worse than the French were the Polish prisoners. There were constant fights breaking out. So a lot of non-Jewish political prisoners. Yeah, were criminal there. as well as political. So you were in Kaiserwald, you have in your notes, 42 to 43. Yeah. This was a concentration camp. Right. Do you remember anything more about it? No, somehow there is a big blank in Kaiserwald. Just uh, a lot of paying at attention. I don't remember exactly what kind of work we did. What I was assigned to was just routine. My mind somehow is kind of blank during this time when I was there. Uh, and uh, I do remember when we were shipped out from there. We were shipped out on some barge. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also remember falling off that barge or being pushed off. I still don't know what happened. The barge was going very slow and I did not know how to swim. Uh, and somebody threw me a rope and put me back up. And when I screamed, I don't know how to swim, they said, well, do like a dog. That's the, you know, that's how I learned how to swim. I picture where this is. This is the North Sea, right? Right. Must yeah, but that cold. was an inlet. Yeah, it was an inlet. We were on this barge, and uh, we were shipped to another camp, and I don't remember exactly, it was a small camp. Also on the, on the border of, uh, of the sea, and then we were put on a big ship. Uh, I don't remember wha what that town was. And this ship, we were on for a couple of days, and then they took us off the ship back on a barge. I don't really know the reason for it, but that's what they did. And with this barge, eventually we wound up in Danzig, near the port of Danzig. 
in Danzig, we went to a, to a concentration camp called Tüthoff, where again, in Tüthoff, we were assigned now to different kind of work. Now that was, by that time already it was late in 43, uh, probably was, by the time I got to Stuttgart, it was already 44. I, I somehow lost track of what really happened during the time in between. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any of the people you were with during this time? Kaiser Welt on the barge, on the ship? By name? Or do you remember mm -hmm. who they were, even if you don't remember them? Somehow I remember some faces what they looked like, but again, after all these years, that's probably distorted. You've not seen them again? You no. Yeah, no. From that time? No, I did not see them again, because everybody, after they were sorted out and shipped to different camps, some of them uh, even remained in the uh, crematorium camps. Do some of them were sent to creation studies. Do you helping studies. anyone, or anyone helping you, or interacting? I, I remember that being I was so young that a lot of young men, a little bit older than myself, seemed to uh, watch out over me. Uh, I somehow always was blessed with someone looking over me. People took a liking to me quite easily of my own people. Even the Latvian Jews that did not like German Jews, I learned to speak Yiddish uh, shortly after in Riga, which my was not within my, I didn't speak Yiddish before coming to Riga. I learned it right there. And I think they appreciated that I wasn't speaking German to them, that I spoke in Yiddish. And they made me one of them. And uh, I always had the admiration and respect from a little bit older than myself, may they be five years or ten years older, these men. And somehow I was always blessed to watch be watched over. And when in, in Stutthof, yeah. we yeah. were, yeah, then from there I was assigned to work in the shipyards of Danzig. In order to work there, they sent us to a different labor camp called Burchgraben. I don't know exactly how to spell it, Burchgraben, that's the best way I remember it. If I say it wrongly, well, after all this time, that's the best I can do. Borscht-Graben. Yeah. Graben has to do with grave. No, graben or could digging. also be digging, yeah. Digging. Yeah, digging. Mm -hmm. And Borscht is a burg. Borscht is, town. no, no, uh, Borscht is a castle. Like something, what you dig around the castle, around the bush. Borscht-Graben. Yeah, the graben, the right, correct. So that was the name of a... Labor camp. camp, right. There were barracks over there. Mm -hmm. We lived in barracks. We went every day by train. It was not a long ride to Danzig, to the shipyards, where I worked as a painter on German U-boats, painting with the battle grape paint, which at that time, of course, nobody knew that this type of lead loaded paint was poisonous. Uh, I was assigned, being I was so thin and yet strong, I was assigned to work on the inside of the ship, not on the outside, where uh, the fumes of this paint were terrible. I was wearing uh, a flashlight on my forehead and had to crawl into some round pipes big enough to crawl in, in which there were cables. And these cables needed to be painted, even from the side that were against the wall of this pipe, sometimes difficult to get to. When the SS came with the bigger lights and shined down along the cables, God forbid if you missed the spot, you were in lots of trouble. For one thing, you didn't get your soup. And you know, you painted with a brush. Yeah, I had different sizes, but some very small ones to get behind there, and some bigger ones. But 
inside the cable. Amazing. Uh, b on the belly and on my back, with this little flashlight in front of my forehead, and uh, was painting this. Uh, so this was Ziggy early Bot 1944. Right. At the shipyard. That was in 44. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I was there in for from 44. This is the camp in Burgdorf where I was eventually liberated. Oh. So you were there a year. Yeah. Because yeah, at least a year. At least a year. I don't remember exactly what months we came there. Uh. So when were you liberated? 45? Uh, yeah. In March, March of 1945, I was liberated by the Russian troops. You worked doing this work, this painting, for all that time? Until I took quite sick. I got typhus, uh. diarrhea. And by that time, uh, the Germans were running very short in labor and uh, uh, would try to isolate people with typhus, even though there was no direct medication given, but by isolating and some of the people overcame the typhus by uh, killing off the clothes and the lice and so on and recuperated and were able to be reused as laborers as regardless how skinny they were but it was better for them than nothing and when I took so very sick it was actually the second time around the first time I recouped a little I just had diarrhea and back to work and then near the end I was very sick I, I really had, I understand there were different strains of typhus. Some stomach, some skin, I, I don't know what they c call it, what the descriptions are, but they affected the person differently. But all of them really came with very severe cases of diarrhea. I remember myself melting from the inside out, losing weight very rapidly. And this was the early spring, late winter of 1945. Uh, that's yes, well I would say early spring, or yeah, late winter, early spring of 1945. Uh, I, I, I remember in February, I assume it was February, where I, we suddenly heard a lot of aircraft overhead, a lot of shooting, and we realized that the Russian troops were coming very, very close. The SS and the people that watched over us also had built some uh, cannons, flag cannons to shoot at airplanes nearby the camp. And when these airplanes came over, they fired at the airplanes. And the people, the Russian people in the airplane thought that this was uh, a military camp. And they really started to attack this camp very, very severely. Not with bombs, but with um, machine guns from the aircrafts, whatever you call it, guns from the aircraft. Uh, yeah, I, I let you know a little what happened to me here. I was in this barrack where I was recuperating a little. I was strong enough that I could get out of bed and stand up. In the upper bunk was a man who was doing a lot better already. That's why he was in the upper bunk. I was in the lower bunk. And I got out of the bunk and I'm talking to him leaning on to the upper bunk. And he's, he's leaning on an elbow and looking at me. And we are talking. And we hear the guns, the machine guns, and the flag, the cannons, and the shooting going on. It already became a way of life. Where could we go? Just keep on doing what you're doing. We wouldn't, the only time we probably stopped talking is the noise was so loud that we could not hear each other. And we're talking, and I, I have suddenly his head comes forward, and I pull my hands, and his head comes into my hands, and I call his name. I don't remember his name. I, one time I did. Right now I don't. And I call his name and he didn't answer me. And I pushed him back. Blood came streaming out of his mouth. What happened? A bullet pierced 
through the roof, through his chest, and killed him instantly. He was recuperating from typhus, and he was killed by what apparently was a Russian bullet. Strafing. Yes. From the Russians. Yeah. What a memory. Yeah. So. Wow. And then? The well, Russian then uh, uh, after that, uh, the, the Russians came closer, and the SS started to sort out the stronger groups and uh, uh, started marching people out of the camps to different camps because they didn't want no Jewish Jews, Jewish prisoners to be taken, um, didn't want Jews to be taken prisoner by the Russians. So if they would, they felt they would still need us in some factories in Germany, they still didn't give up, they still didn't believe that the war was lost. And they just marched us out of the camp, just on an endless march without a death destination. I shouldn't say us, they at that time they marched several groups out, the strongest ones at first. I remained still behind. Then, in the, like in the very beginning of March, one day, they took two groups again, the ones that had somewhat recuperated, like myself, and they marched us out of camp. But we noticed the SS was not there. These were older men from the Wehrmacht, people that were not assigned to fight in the front lines. Mm -hmm. And they were wearing different uniforms. We marched out like in two groups. I was in the last group. And then they, they said we should stop. They were not very rough on us or anything, these people. They just marched us and they made believe, you know, screaming a little bit and carrying their gun over their shoulder rather than pointing it. And uh, we came to a, a foresty area not far from the camp. I don't know, a half an hour, an hour away from the camp. And they said that they had uh, to go and use the bathroom. We better not move, stay here, you know. And they all went through this forest, and they never came back. So somehow they found news that the war was lost, or the Russians were too close, or whatever these Wehrmacht people made up to abandon us to fight for ourselves. We were on, your own. We were on our own. Didn't know what to do. This is March. Yeah, beginning of March. Didn't know what to do. Strange, everything is strange around. Too weak, too, too disoriented to think, too sick to move, too weak to do anything. So some of us made a decision to go back to the camp. Because that was home. Besides, we left some very sick people behind there, and they possibly needed attention. So we went back to the camp, grabbing. When we came back to the camp on that particular day, I also remember that suddenly some shrapnel busted out right over the camp. You know, these this bombs that shrapnel blow apart. There was this hay wagon, a huge hay wagon, this old-fashioned large big hay wagon. When I realized there was one shrapnel popping out right over me, which I thought was very close by. I dove under the hay wagon. But my tush and my legs were exposed. And after it all settled, I knew what was burning in my legs and even in my tush. And I still have scars in my legs and in my tush from these shrapnels that were later removed after my liberation. And then there was this, this man, Somka, I knew. This is the man I remember by name, Sonny Somka. He was a Russian, a Lithuanian or Russian uh, Jewish person, strong man, very strong will, strong minded. He spoke good Russian, good Yiddish, and he had very good command, and somehow he remains physically strong. And there was this, this bunker. I could only these days relate to it that it might have been at one time one of these potato bunkers where the farmers uh, might have uh, kept potatoes and beets in for the winter, but of a very large size. It was a really a very large room size, okay, bigger than a large basement in a house. In the ground. In the ground. Mm -hmm. And the doors were wooden doors 
in the front, but they were flat on the ground over a hole. Mm -hmm. But they were like wooden steps going down into the hole. Mm -hmm. These are the things I remember. And th the fighting came closer and closer. And we remembered how many people got killed by that time from flying bullets, like I explained before about this young man. We decided it would be safer to go into this bunker, even though that could be penetrated with bullets also, but we felt it would be safer. So we all went, whoever could possibly walk and make it into the bunker, typhus, no typhus, didn't make no difference, we all went into this hole. And suddenly, after some time, there was a total quiet, a kind of quiet that after this kind of shooting could be extremely frightening. It's very hard to explain after this kind of bombardment when there's suddenly a total lull. It is just as frightening as the bombing. And Somka was standing near the steps. I was shortly behind him. And uh, after a while, suddenly, we heard some foreign voices outside. And Somka said, shh, that's Russian. And the doors swung open, and these Russian soldiers came with their automatic rifle right into the basement and, you know, and started to scream to identify ourselves. And Somka, knowing the Russian, I think he said, Swahi or something, which is Russian, we are your own. And they didn't at first believe us. They thought maybe we were hiding some Nazis down there. Uh, and they had to uh, be kind of tough, and they searched. And uh, more soldiers came. They stood at the door. A couple of guys went inside looking, and they saw that we were all Jewish people with the zebra stripes and the Bogdovitz. They went out of the bunker. A little while later, uh, a big truck pulled up, an army truck, and here this officer, this Russian officer, officer, comes out, and Somka was at the top step by this time, and so Somka speaks to him in Russian. And suddenly I see Somka looking around and breaking out in a big grin. He said, and he said in Yiddish, "It's a yid." So this officer was a Jewish man in the Russian army. And of course, immediately helicopters came and, and stuff to uh, uh, give us some supply and they did the best they could to put us into back into the barracks for, I don't know, a day or two to do the best they could with us to delouse us and to give us injections or whatever they did, I don't know, to uh, rid us of the typhus. They really knew what to do. And they had the medication of what to do. Then they shipped us into the city of Danzig, and we are, we are located into what was a huge school at one time, and it became a hospital for the Russian soldiers and for some of us. We were shipped to this year hospital to recuperate. It really didn't take very long to recuperate once we were under their supervision. The food was the food, and medication was medication, and we were strong enough to become helpful in the hospital. And we are some of us were assigned to do certain work, and we were happy to do certain work at the hospital. Like if I remember, Somka was in charge of horses and blankets and stuff, and this other guy, Ewald, Another name who came to me, Ewald Owl was his name. He just now came to me. He, uh, he, he was working in a commissary somehow for food to distribute. And me, I was assigned to the kitchen. What was, what was I supposed to do in the kitchen? Not to cook. I had the night job to work at night in the kitchen. All I had to do is boil water. Why was it so important to boil water in those days? 
right now, even you probably couldn't think of why, but that was to sterilize equipment. That's the days where you had to boil water to sterilize equipment for the surgeons, for, for the doctors, and so on. And besides, the Russians are good tea drinkers. And doing their work, the doctors, they would call if they could have a kettle of hot water or tea. And that was my job, to deliver the tea and hot water, sterilized water, and sterilize some uh, um, towels and stuff, boil them out, and send them back up there. So that was my job in that night kitchen. <laughs> yeah. So we remained there for some time in this hospital. And it's really odd. Here, we're hoping to be free. We're hoping. What else could we be but free? We were freed by the Russians, we're no longer under Ger German jurisdiction or in a concentration camp. When we became strong after a few weeks, the three of us were called into an office, and uh, Office of the Russian Army asked us, please to join the Russian Army. In after all, in gratuity, they saved our lives and they nourished us back to health. What else should we do and could do? And says, you can think about it. They didn't, they didn't really press us openly to go ahead right now, but how would you like to go in training? We'll take good care of you and they'll ship you to wherever, what city where you will have all modern facilities, you'll be safe and all that. So anyway, after this meeting, Somka, who is so bright, he says to us, to Ewald and me, he says, we're not going to sign nothing. Say, they are not much different than the Nazis. They're going to use us as cannon powder. There's no way we're going to sign. We're going to stall and stall and see. Maybe the whole thing will blow over and they don't need us anymore. A few days came, we were called back to the office. If you thought about it and so on, nah, we still want to think about it, we still don't feel strong enough and so on. And then Somka says, look, we got to get out of here. We cannot stay here. How do we get out of here? He says, well, we'll get out. Eva brought some, took some food, blankets, I don't know, some kind of blankets, and horses, three horses, and I don't remember, but I got out of the kitchen also some stuff that we packed up, and we saddled up some horses that night, and we rode out of the hospital camp, and we hid in the forest, contemplating of what to do. So anyway, we had to run away from the Russians. We made ourselves closer towards the border of Germany, had to cross this river. There were two, two rivers, Frankfurt am Main and I forgot now the name of another river by the same name. Uh, something. There was oh, on the order, not the right, on the order. It was the order, and we had to cross this river in order to get back into Germany, which we wanted to do because we wanted to look for our parents and also wanted to reach safety. We figured if Germany is defeated, the war was over by that time. It was oh yeah, the war by that time was over, was done, had finished. Surrendered. Had surrendered, uh, you know, and uh, people. Yeah, it was I, I was liberated in March, mm -hmm. so yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I believe April. I bel if I'm not mistaken, it was in the beginning of May when Hitler committed the suicide, when it was known that Hitler was dead, you know, so, so the real thing, the real peacemaking probably was in May or so, uh, mm -hmm. that's a matter of, uh, uh, to look up for a historian. I just lived my life day by day in those days, and days not always had a meaning or dates did not always have a meaning. Uh, so anyway, we eventually were able to cross this river. It took some time because there was only one bridge 
to cross it and was bombed out. We saw people repairing this bridge and they were just about finished as the railroad. And we heard this uh, train coming and sure enough the train crossed here. So we waited and we saw another train. We stormed the train. Then it went on. Oh yeah, we just took what we possibly could. No big guns, just handguns and stuff like that. We had plenty. Guns you could find on so many dead soldiers, it was not even funny. You could get, at that time, we were ban banning the horses even a little bit before that already, because we could get a jeep or that type of vehicle that was abandoned. If it did not have enough gasoline, we found another jeep that had gas but was damaged, so we siphoned the gas from there into this jeep and we had, there were ways of getting around. If you want to live, you want to fight for life, you find a way of getting there. We didn't leave any obstacle in our way to do what we had to do, including storming this train, which was manned by a German engineer who was running the train and a couple of Russian soldiers. Well, of course, the Russian soldiers didn't like one bit that we stormed the train, so we asked them in a nice way to leave. No other comment. So they left. And the engineer, we ordered to just go ahead and take us. Where is he going? He said he's going to Berlin, to the Russian zone in Berlin. Fine. We went with him. He told us we had to get off. You know, he was cooperative with us. We went off in the Russian zone of Berlin and fought our way through this zone. We had to go through a small part of the British zone and then into the American zone. All on this train? No. An engine? By foot. We left the train in the Russian occupied part of Berlin. Berlin was divided in three parts, no different than Germany French, English, and American. American. Uh, French, Russian. Uh, and Russian. Russian. I mean, American, no, not British. French, British, American. And Russian, right? And we left this uh, the train in the Russian occupied zone. Before you leave the train, I understand you took care of the Russian soldiers. Yes. You weren't the only ones on the train with the engineers. There were no other human beings on no the train. Other human no, beings. these were empty trains. Oh. They were apparently brought something there, and uh, they were like uh, freight trains. Freight trains. Train. Some of them were cattle cars, some of them were flat cars, you know, for the transport. Okay. I don't remember any stuff in the trains, and we didn't bother looking around. And no other people? No, we didn't see any other people. Okay. So then we worked ourselves into the American zone of Berlin, and we found out oh, where the UNRWA headquarters was in the highest, in the joint distribution center. I don't remember which one we approached first, but wherever we came and we identified ourselves, they were shocked that we were still alive. See, everybody knew of the three ungrateful Jews that did so wrong to their Russian liberators, stole horses, stormed the train, and whatever better catch them and your lives are not safe here he or any place. This is what we were told. Everybody knew about it. They were surprised that we were still alive and how we got there. Yeah. I mean, there was so much. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So anyway, they hit us very nicely. We recouped for a few days and we felt it was too dangerous even to remain in the American zone of Berlin. We wanted to get into the English or American zone of Germany. Of course, my hometown was occupied by the Brit British troops. And we made our way then, again, we needed to fight our way out of this Berlin zone into eventually the American zone and made our way into Germany. And then my story will continue on uh, uh, coming to Halton.
and i am sweating.